Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the City of Independence, I welcome each of you in attendance, as well as those of you who are watching this meeting on City 7, to the August 28th meeting of the Independence Planning Commission. Before we begin our meeting, let's rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our meetings, it is responsibility of this commission to hold public hearings and make recommendations to the Independent City Council on matters related to zoning and land use changes within our city. We also consider and make decisions on plats, special use permits, and other issues, as well as changes in codes and policies that relate to city planning. Our procedure for each case is as follows. First, the applicant will be recognized to speak on behalf of their case, followed by anyone else in attendance that wishes to speak in favor of the matter. Then, those who are in opposition or who have questions regarding the case will then be recognized to speak. If there was opposition or questions from the public, the applicant will be allowed a rebuttal period to address those concerns or questions. And once the applicant is finished, the chair will declare the public hearing portion of the case closed and further comment from the public at that point will not be recognized. The commission, however, will have the opportunity to discuss the merits of the case with one another and during the discussion, we reserve the right to ask questions of all parties concerned. And finally, we will render a decision in the case. Because this is the only public hearing of the cases on the agenda tonight, all those who wish to speak will be heard. All comments and questions should be addressed to the chair and not directly to the applicant or directly to the city staff. The chair also requests that statements be kept brief and on point. Please do not ramble. And if that statement has already been made by a previous speaker, you're welcome to stand and say, I agree with that speaker. Now to expedite tonight's meeting, the chair asks that everyone who wishes to testify or who thinks that they may testify, please stand now and be sworn in. Those standing, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth before this commission? If so, please answer, I do. Thank you. You may be seated. The first uh, item on our agenda is I need a motion um, to see if we would like to remove the consent, uh, the first item, remove it from the consent agenda. Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. I move that I make a motion that we suspend the rules in case number 18-310-02, Stone Canyon, second plot. Okay, you make a motion that we, we remove it to the regular agenda and suspend the rules, yes. correct? Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Cindy moved and Tina seconded. Unless there's any discussion, we're ready for the vote. Okay. Um, Commission, Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Commissioner McCain, McLean? Yes. And Chairman Ashball? Yes. So case number 18-310-02, preliminary plat, Stone Canyon, second plat, has been removed to the regular public hearing. The rules have been suspended, which allows anyone who is here in the audience to speak on that. So is the applicant present? Just, I just want to know if you're present. Okay, thank you. Do you guys have something to say about this real quick? Yeah, I'll give a, a brief uh, presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, this case, D&D uh, &D, uh, development, uh, they're requesting uh, preliminary plat approval to uh, construct eight 
single family residences on eight new lots. Um, this proposal would add those eight to the existing 106 that um, are approved for the development right now, making uh, 114 lots. Uh, two of the lots added would be south of Stone Canyon Drive at the western edge of the plat. And then, actually, it would probably be helpful to, if we could look at the plat. Um, two would be at the western edge, and six would be um, added to the north side at the eastern edge um, near White Sands Court. Uh, the plat uh, will be created from portions of the existing golf course, which is uh, owned by Jackson County Land Trust. Uh, development of the six uh, most eastern uh, lots will, in fact, um, involve having um, to relocate a gar uh, golf cart path as well as um, one of the holes. Um, uh, a little background here. Uh, according to the fire code, uh, developments of one and two family homes where number of dwellings exceed 100 um, require um, separate access roads. Um, and currently, this development um, has one access. Um, right now, um, permits have been issued for 100 lots. Um, if the approved, um, if uh, if approved, uh, uh, the final plat for the second plat um, should not be brought before the planning commission until the second entrance is provided. Okay. Does anybody have questions, of Brian or Charlie, before we proceed? So I have one question. Okay. Um, you said right now there's 99. No. There's no. What, go ahead. Let no. Me, sorry. Go, <laughs> can you finish your question? <laughs> there's. You think there's 99 homes? There's. We've issued 100 building permits. Um, I. I. I think every foundation has been dug. I'm not sure yet. Okay. I, I, we're, again, the permits being issued and what construction has actually taken place, I, I'm not sure how that matches up. But um, the, the restriction that was put on the plat that was approved back in 2007 stated that, and I can read it actually here verbatim, it says building permits will not be issued for more than 100 single family homes and not any other main buildings in this phase of the development until a second means of access is provided. Um, so again, we've issued 100 building permits at this point. Okay, and back then there was not any indication where a second access point would be. Yes, there was. There. Uh, back, where was that? Um, Brian, can you bring the map up of the aerial map? There. Um, if you kind of, you can kind of see where that road is. There would be on the western edge of the subdivision, and then how it uh, terminates. Um, if you can kind of follow that up and it kind of swerves around up to the north and then back up to 39th Street. That was uh, the original plan that the development would take that track and go all the way back up to 39th Street. And then, of course, there would be uh, homes built along that as well. Um, there was a second and third plat that were done, um, approved preliminary, but the final plats were never approved on those two uh, phases. Okay. All right. Would the applicant please come forward? And when you do, please make sure you state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Kevin S. Stallings, 5282 Northeast Ashgrove Court, Lee Summit, Missouri, 64064. Okay, thank you, sir. Could you just kind of tell us what your plans are and what you're wanting to do? Well, it's kind of a long story, and I'll shorten it the best I possibly can. I took on this project back in 2014 to build the homes. I was unaware that I could only pull 100 permits of the 106 lots that I purchased. Uh, we are in contact with the bank that sold it to me because I was aware that I could build all 106 lots uh, in this particular phase, only recently to be learned that is not possible. Um, 
the purpose of these lots are twofold. One, to the right or be the east side of that hole, there's a lot of drainage issues because there's a very large berm. And the purpose is we're gonna take a lot of that dirt and move it to the other side of the golf course and put in fringe drains to run down the east side of the golf course to help with the drainage there. Okay, before you go, can you show that us kind of on the map mm -hmm. exactly where you're talking about? Um, back there can be the hole. Yes, sir. And once you're there, as long as you're there, you, if this is to happen, the hole is going to be relocated? The hole is going to be relocated. I've actually got a picture of what it's going to look like. Can I show that? Yes, you may. Thank you. Mr. Sorens. Yeah. We have a laser pointer if you'd like. Awesome. Just, you just push this red button. Do you have a little bill to get that up? Or? No. no. <laughs> Sorry. Here's what's going to happen with the hole. About one hundred and twenty thousand dollars to move the hole forward. Go ahead and speak. It's about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars to move this hole forward, and move that dirt from one side over the other side. Huh? Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is very bad. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. The hole is currently back here. We're gonna move it forward to there so the additional six lots, the cart path, can all be relocated. And this mountain of dirt that's over here, and when I say a mountain, it's about 12, 13 foot tall, is gonna be relocated over to here so we can put a fringe drain from up here all the way down the side and move the water on down. This development came with many drainage issues, uh, all of which I fixed except for two, so. Thank you for showing that to us. Um, the second part. Yeah, if, and go ahead if there's other things you were going to tell right. us. This the second part of this is I'm working closely with MDNR. The reason that road will not go through is the methane levels are too high in this area and they will not allow it. Um, they said indefinitely the road will not go through. Um, we've noticed the probe that is located behind the school has been gradually increasing over the last couple of years. We need to install two new extraction wells behind hole 16 and 17, which is slightly to the west of there. The purpose of this is to help extract more methane, more methane gas in hopes to get the levels down. This project on our part is going to cost $157,000. That's a lot of money. So that's another purpose of these lots, putting them in to help raise the money that we're going to need to do the mitigation issues that MDNR has proposed. They are handling all the hazardous waste. We just have to help them put the laterals in and get the methane gas pulled over. That's the second part. The fact that we need a second entrance, I have sped up. I am currently negotiating with Ross Miller, the landowner to the west. Um, you can see it right here. Yeah, I think they, they want to, they want to use a pointer and be able to speak into the microphone okay. at the same time. <laughs> That's why. Currently right there, you'll see the land that goes like that all the way around. Yes. That is the land that I'm in negotiations in with Ross Miller. Uh, you see right here where there's a pond located right there. That pond is where our future pool is going to go, which is something the development's never had. The entrance that we're going to put in is located right there, and it's just above a very steep bluff off of I-70 located right there. So I think it proposes a good safety issue to keep traffic off of I-70 coming in. Plus, there's a really large berm that comes across here, which really helps cut down on the noise. So this is the entrance that we want to install, which will bring us compliant with the fire marshal. Uh, we are seeking a meeting with the fire marshal to look for a variance because we need to get through the eight lots to get the extraction wells in, then start the 24 lots. And before we sell a single lot in the 24 lots, that new entrance will be in. Now, we're also going to improve 
the outer road that goes uh, along the, the storage units right there all the way up to Ross Miller's property with curb and gutter. So it'll be brand new asphalt, brand new curb and gutter, giving a second entrance to Stone Canyon. Um, we believe that about the break point about right here, most of the residents right there will come through this entrance right here. The rest will go ahead and go out through that, that entrance right there. Okay. And in the, f in the future, there, there is a plan for more homes over to the northwest? Or is that still uh, around hole six and seven? Unfortunately, that's not going to happen until 2028. That's because you got to mitigate all the methane. Um, no, that's because the bondholders has a broken CID and they don't know how to fix it. The longest forbearance I can get is a two year forbearance and no bank will loan any money on a two year forbearance. I need a minimum of five. So unless I get a cash donor that wants to invest in this project, which is unlikely, I have to wait until the CID expires, which is 2027, to buy the land in 2028. Because there are 89 homes around hole six and seven and another 74 maintenance provided townhomes, which will be on the south side of 39th Street to be installed. So that is in 2028. My hopes is if this goes well with Ross Miller, that um, the land that is located beyond his house all the way down to the little blue will entail light industrial down to the bottoms that will basically connect with little Menards right there. It will include some multifamily in the bottoms. And as you come up the hill, we'll have low end single family. And at the top of the hill and over the hill looking at the golf course will be high end single family, exactly what's in Stone Canyon right now. I'm hoping that'll keep me busy until 2028. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to share with us? Um, there's a lot of issues there, but I think since I've been here and since 2011, I brought a lot of departments, Independence, Blue Spring School District, the bondholders, the bank, and MDNR together, and we've got a pretty good thing going, and it's working, and everybody's pleased. In the past, there's been a lot of distrust and promises made by the previous developer that were never upheld. To this date, since I got there, there were five homes built in five years. From 2011 to nine, now we've almost completely done. And I, I think we've done very well with it. So um, I think it's a good project. Okay. Uh, does anyone here have questions? I have one question. Um, have you shared this with the other residents in the development, what your plans are? Um, we are setting up a meeting, a town hall meeting uh, for that. And one other issue that has come up recently, hopefully for September the 19th, Wednesday to September the 19th, uh, which we're hoping that will happen after we've already met with, uh, it's not gonna be Chief Short, it's gonna be, who's the person underneath Chief Short? Cindy Pope. Cindy. Hopefully with Cindy and George, we want to sit down, give them our plan of action. With the eight lots, we're trying to give to the fire department something that they weren't able to get when the golf course bar and grill were installed. They wanted a fire hydrant installed down at the maintenance building in case of a fire. That was never done. It's about a $42,000 run to get the fire hydrant down there. We want to incorporate that in with the eight lots, and that would make them very happy in the event of a fire. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak in favor of this case? Okay. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak in favor? I mean, would like to speak against this or who has questions? Please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record, please. Hello, my name is Rochelle Lowe and I live at 4330 South Stone Canyon Drive. Um, I would just like to state that, like Kevin said, uh, most of our homeowners in the subdivision have not heard of this plan. I just heard of it Sunday evening. I live um, on lot 23 back there. 
So these uh, new flats that are being proposed are directly across from me. When I purchased my home four years ago, this was never considered. I was purchasing a home that had um, a golf course view in front of me and back of me. And so that's something, that's why I purchased that lot. And um, what we were shown at the time for this entire plat and the phasing showed that the connection would be made back out to um, 39th Street. So this is a new development that we have not heard about at all in our subdivision. And um, it's something that I would like to wait until our September 19th uh, town hall meeting that um, Mr. Stallings mentioned until we are able to hear what he has to say, hear his proposal, not saying that at that time we wouldn't be able to um, move forward with his suggestions if it was in favor, if everyone was in favor. Just like to give the opportunity for all of us to hear it before we proceed, um, since it is dramatic, drastically different from what we originally knew when we purchased our home. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak against this or ha who has questions? Please come forward. Uh, and give your name and address for the record, please. Yeah, good evening, folks. Terry Norwood, 4316 South Stone Canyon Drive. Uh, me too. Those, I'm a couple doors down from the last speaker. Uh, this, when we purchased this home about two years ago, almost to the month, uh, one of the things that was attractive is we had the views on each side. I was told that there would not be development at that time, and uh, so that meant it would be quiet on each side. We had uh, houses on the left, but they built one right immediately next to us. So we kind of had the uh, opinion that development is full at this time, and we bought into what we hoped quiet little neighborhood. I understand life. Um, you know, in high school, there were 200 million people. We celebrated that. Not too many years ago, there's 300 million. I understand you now there's 340, 350, somewhere in that neighborhood. You gotta put them somewhere. And uh, so I'm, I'm somewhat of a realist. Um, was a little disappointed to hear that it appears that we can't build additional homes where there is no one and that those would be attractive to those buyers because there's not anything. But this project's going to be put on the shoulders of those that are already there. And the few will have to pay for whatever is made in the economic gain. I'm, on, I'm not against money. I'm just a few years from retirement and that's why we downsized uh, to get in this home in the quiet little neighborhood. Uh, that my wife and I can watch the kids on each side of us grow up until there comes a point in time where we can no longer care for the home or for that matter, care for each other. And there's only so many years when my, my run on this uh, planet is done and I'm just a couple of years from retirement so a lot of plans were being made to, to go into this. Uh, thank you uh, for your consideration. Uh, for the developers, lots of property I think are lots of loss, but I'm not sure it should be uh, put on the backs of the few. And uh, again, not against money, but if there are other places immediately close, sounds like there's difficulty with building in those areas, pricing, uh, zoning. Uh, but again, shouldn't probably come back to us who've already purchased ours under different arrangements. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, if I may, I know we've suspended the rules, but just a question to the last two speakers. Okay. Recognizing that home equity is the most significant equity or asset for most families, what is the adverse impact if the houses were built across from where you are now? And I'd like to hear from both of you on that. And, and, and of course, I'm not asking for a statistically valid estimate, but a reasonable estimate. Just make sure you speak in the microphone, please. Yes, yeah, so Rochelle Lowe again. Um, I can't speak to the value of my home difference um, from these lots going in, if that's what your question was. But um, the negative impacts I see from this happening is during um, 
like the last gentleman just stated, um, when these constructions are going in, it's going to be directly impacting me, and I have young children that um, stay home. And uh, when you bring in a lot of different um, construction, um, I just don't know who these people are coming in on my neighborhood every day, and so it makes me very nervous for the um, safety of my children and myself during that time. I know that lasts a short period of time, but then again, that is put on um, me for that, um, however long that is, a couple years that it'll take to build out those six lots. And then the other negative impact I see is just opening it up to that outer road. Um, I'm not sure what type of traffic that would bring in. It just, um, then we see, there's this entrance right off I-70 that people can see, that people then are curious and want to enter into our neighborhood to see what's there. And again, like I said, I have children in elementary school that um, I was hoping to raise in that home until we got to high school and they graduated. Then I could downsize and retire one day. But, um, and so, I'm just worried about the safety, and that's the native impact that I see coming from this uh, proposed plan. So that's where I'd like to hear more about that from Mr. Stallings and others who have um, thought about this more than I have for two days. Perhaps my question was too narrow, and I appreciate you rescuing me in my question. <laughs> okay. Is there any, oh, go ahead, sir, I'm sorry. Go Again, ahead. this is Terry Norwood. Um, Appreciate the question. I don't know if I'm going to help rescue you or not, Mr. Preston. Uh, I guess it depends on the marketplace. You know, we're now living in a time where if you have a home within certain values, you seem to sell it before the sun goes down and, and get multiple offers. If you've been around the block a few times, we've all lived in the areas where it's just the opposite. In our, you can say factually, in our decision making process of purchasing the homes, one of the factors was it needed to be attractive for resale. It's an opinion, yes, for my opinion. We thought that this would be more attractive in resale because of it had character. We all have enough neighborhoods where we kind of stack them in there and you, you know what that is and we, and we need that. Can we have to put the people? Uh, quickly, I grew up here, spent good portion of my life here, but it's also away 20 years. Some of that was in Southern Cal. I went out to see how all those smart people did things. One of the great communities is Santa Barbara. I think every American can nod their head. But you know the attractive portion of Santa Barbara is they required every homeowner, every builder to put an acre in there. And the, the beauty of that place is, there, is open spaces and those. And that's why we have parks and this, we have those. Uh, that was our call, our judgment, and we just hope it comes through with the markets. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to share? If so, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Cornick. I live at 4220 South White Sands uh, on the corner lot that Kevin mentioned. Uh, a few minutes ago. I've been a resident of this uh, subdivision since 09, probably I think the second family to move in uh, back when uh, the area was first developed and uh, been a lot of things under the water, still a lot of things to work through in this area. But um, the first thing I'd like to have agreement with the, the previous two in, in terms of uh, one issue particularly and that is that the people of the subdivision need to be brought up to date on what Mr. Stallings uh, overall plan is. The 85 to 90 people that live in there I think deserve that and deserve some kind of a voice even though that'll be probably a, a difficult meeting for us to get through because everybody has opinions but it needs to happen. And um, I think all of us that live there, and I think Kevin and other people that uh, the city, the county, all want this development to be as good as it can, it can be, and it can be something great. The golf course is a great golf course. The subdivision is a great course, and I think we all have the, the same intent. And uh, uh, 
I think that at this point, I would like to ask the commission to possibly uh, delay the, the decision on the preliminary plats until everybody in the subdivision is brought up uh, on board to, to an equal level and we have um, our voice and, uh, and then proceed with moving the train because I have an, uh, somewhat of a, um, I guess, knowledge that once the, the train's on the track, but once the train starts moving, it's, it's hard to stop it. And so I think that this might be uh, something that, that I would hope the commission would maybe consider to defer for at least a month on the preliminary plat and then pursue and hopefully that won't cause any real major issues so that would be what i would have to say thank you sir mm -hmm. i don't know who to who this question goes to but why weren't the the residents told about the about the changes hi jackie maloney attorney with real law um, llc and i represent um, D, D residential development do you need my address sure what is it? <laughs> I just started my firm. It is 301 Southeast Douglas Suite 201, Lee Summit, Missouri. Um, so this was this was the plan uh, to go in, get the preliminary plat on file. We were adamant with staff at that time. We know that there is an issue with needing another entrance. We would like to have a discussion and get this worked out prior to the planning commission. Um, we asked uh, on several different occasions, what is the solution? Where are we, where are we, where are we? Um, planning Commission comes up and um, we pull the staff report and it says, um, today the only decision is on the preliminary plat um, because we're going to have to defer on this second issue of the entrance. That is really, uh, I don't know how we're gonna report on, on any of this until we know what the solution is. Um, it's not like Kevin was being secretive at all and did bring this up to several neighbors and I have even had conversations with the neighbors and said, hey, if there are specific concerns, let me know. And um, it's, it's not playing hide the ball. We don't know what the plan is for the, the outside road and um, because one, we haven't had the discussions and the decision from the fire chief. Um, two, uh, MDNR is still an, uh, a wild card here. And then three, MoDOT. That's MoDOT right of way. So uh, yes, we can go and have a, a, a discussion about um, several different things, but it would be nice to know what we are even proposing. Um, and again, we have reached out to the neighbors. We haven't sent, sent out a, a, a notice and had a neighborhood meeting because one, we wanted to figure out the entrance issue, um, but two, um, <laughs> it has been kind of hide the ball, um, not just, it's, it's a two-way street. Um, we have asked for feedback, we have asked for specific concerns, and um, it, 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 it was not forthcoming. Just so I can understand what you just said, <laughs> okay. Are you, are you saying that you were asking the city for feedback and, and haven't received any? No, no, no what we are, you what we need. be more specific need. about. Okay, just what we need is a plan on the, the entrance, the outer road. And we had an all hands meeting, a, a pre um, application meeting saying, this is what we need. We know that this is an issue that we're gonna have to figure out. Um, as it has come, um, as we have discussed what the different options are and figured out, okay, where are the requirements coming from, it's a fire code requirement. Not a zoning or a platting requirement, it's a fire code requirement. So what... It, so, I don't mean to interrupt, but so you haven't heard back from the fire department? We have a meeting scheduled for early next week with the fire department. Okay. Can I ask... Why is it even on the agenda then? Why, who, how did that come about? Well, so as the commission's aware, we have, when we go through a platting process like this, you have the preliminary plat and the final plat. We received the application for the preliminary plat. We reviewed it with the note that we still have this access issue that needs to be figured out. You'll see the condition that we've recommended because of that on there. 
um, we feel again we presented with an application we move it forward um, we note where there's issues there's an issue put a condition on if we feel appropriate okay all right so just to expedite this a little bit um, are you guys willing to wait a little bit or do you, is it do you have to have this resolved now let me make sure that I understand what the process is um, well, if I think right. we, we vote on it and we're just simply recommending it. Right. right. Staff Council. has recommended approval. This is a platting decision. This is not a zoning decision. This is not a preliminary development plan decision at all. The real issue is going, it, the, the decision on the plat is not the issue. The decision on any variance that we request for, from the fire code or any zoning requirements that are going to have to come before the BZA, that's really going to be where the issue is. This is simply just a platting. This is an administrative decision. Staff has recommended approval. We have a condition with respect to um, figuring out the entrance. There are no neighborhood meeting requirements at all. This is simply a, 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 a an administrative decision. Sure. Um, we have uh, conditions that are on um, CCNRs that are on file in the neighborhood that says the developer can add property at any time during the declarant control period. I mean, there's notice. This is one way that we're going to get the, this property out of land tra trust and back on the tax rolls. So, I mean, I don't understand. I, I understand that, yes, there are, um, there's opposition, but we have satisfied the requirements of the platting um, ordinance. Well, and that's why I'm asking you, because either you just want to go ahead and we'll give our recommendation, and then it goes to the city council, and you just want to go ahead and find out um, what we think, or you're willing to wait to be a little courteous, and that's why I'm uh, with your neighbors. So that's, so why, that's why I'm asking if you can wait. If you can't, then I think we can make a decision on it after we've talked about it for a while. So. That's okay. the only reason I'm asking. I, I, I have a question, though. If we have a recommendation of approval on a preliminary from the City Planning Commission in independence, does it go to the council for consent agenda and all of that? And yep. um, after uh, after Planning Commission, can we then um, uh, get a continuance? Um, and or could we put the um, can the Planning con Commission put conditions on its, uh, its recommendation for approval at the City Council level? Well, our only condition would be, unless somebody else at the City makes this recommendation, is that there has to be a second entrance done before you can proceed. Okay. So okay. that would be the only recommendation that I know of. I think, and, and I think the, let me clarify the question that you asked. I think the question she was asking was, is the commission able to put a condition on if they move approval um, at this meeting are they able to put a condition on that says city council does not hear the item until neighborhood meetings and the fire department oh, we meeting and all that's no. taking place we, well, we can't because do that fact. can we yeah i think we if the if the commission were to put it in yeah yeah, I don't see an issue with that at all. I, if you were to tell us to say, hey, let's just hold off on placing this on the council agenda until we've gone through those particular, again, is that your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's within your power. Um, and I would have to defer to my client. I am just, uh, for me it is, um, we, are, we are here, everyone is here, the neighbors are here that, that have issues with this. Um, we'll have to come, everyone will have to come back and they will, uh, or would you just adjourn it for, you would continue it? continue the meeting right now and adjourn it to until the next meeting so everyone's um, That's complaints what I'm, would yes. be on, we, we can, on the record. We can postpone it. I'm, I think we're trying to extend a courtesy to you folks to know if you really, if sometimes people come and they, they have a timeline. If they don't meet that timeline, all this stuff falls apart that they've set up. So I'm asking if that's the case because otherwise it might be a good idea, a courteous thing to do, to postpone it until you've had your meeting. But I'm just asking, so you can tell me what, how you want to proceed. I'm just the attorney, I don't make, I don't make the decisions here. Again, Kevin Stalling for the record. It is time sensitive in the fact that the construction on the whole needs to be done sometime in November because after December the 18th, we're locked down for about three months of weather. 
that's that's historical. It always happens about December 18th, we're done. We still get stuff done, but not to the magnitude of what we need to get done. <coughs> so it's time sensitive on that aspect. Um, also, if what you were saying, getting the second entrance, we have already spoke with the chief and we're working on setting up conditions. Condition one, we put a fire hydrant in that you want. Condition two, that second entrance will be in within two years to keep the ball rolling on everything else like that. Because if you don't have the sell of lots, money doesn't continue to roll in, this thing will not continue to exist. That's the bottom line of it. So um, it's my hope because I kind of got a gist from the fire department when I spoke to them of what they're going to require of us, what we're going to have to put up to guarantee that we're going to do what we say we're going to do, and I have no issues with that at all. If you approve based on that, we're hoping by October 1st we have all this taken care of. I've already had a meeting with the homeowners, and we've spoken. There is a lot of people that is in favor of this. I have talked to probably 30-plus people, and I've explained the story of what's going on, and they are all in favor of it. I did not ask any of them to come tonight because I did not think it was necessary. That could be held at a later date after we have our town hall meeting. So. Okay. Well, I think um, I think the commissioners probably need to talk among themselves unless there's. I think there's an additional commenter. Okay. That we need to recognize. Well, yeah, because we're not done with the public hearing yet. But please come forward. And just make sure you state your name and address for the record. James Price, James Price. I live at 22500 East 43rd Street Court, lot number nine. And I think I'm going to be really impacted with the second access road. And I would just hope we table this thing until we have an opportunity to meet with Kevin to kind of talk about the second access road. I think that's really going to impact me and my decision because I bought a cul-de-sac for a reason. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to bust that through there to pick the second access road. But I understand there's a traffic flow issue there, and it needs to be addressed and plan changes. But I think in fairness to me, I think we need to sit down with Kevin and have a further discussion on that second access point. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has questions or would like to speak against this? Seeing no movement in the crowd, I would declare the public hearing portion closed. Uh, any comments or further questions from the commissioners? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I know that your intent is to entertain the good people that have appeared here and hear from them. But also I think you are hoping for an accommodation from an investor who is, I think, sincere in his efforts. But I think we have a failure to communicate here. Mm -hmm. And absent some meeting of minds from the investor and the existing homeowners, I think this particular commissioner and probably others will have a difficult time not hearing very well the comments of the residents in as much as the purpose of this commission is to give a voice to people who otherwise wouldn't have a voice in such matters as zoning, special use, etc. I hope uh, the applicant will see the wisdom of your leadership and your offer. Well, thank you. Any other questions, comments from the commissioner? I, I kind of feel the same way. I think that it feels a little premature. It feels like there's too many unknowns. I mean, it, yes, we could approve the plat, but or disapprove the plat. Yeah, right. Yeah, or disapprove, yes. Um, but it just feels like there's just so many unknowns, and I feel like it would be more fair to go ahead and have 
town meeting, find out what fire needs, find out what um, the second entry, see if there's a compromise that could be arrived at. I, I mean, I don't know, it just feels a little, I just feel like I, we don't have legs to stand on, I guess. I agree. Well, so from what you guys are saying, if you want to postpone this to another thing, then you have to make a motion to do so. Otherwise, we will take a vote on whether we think it's a good idea to do this. And just to let you know again, we just recommend to the city council, the city council would have the final say on this. But if we postpone it, which I know you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. I think in reality, as weird as it sounds, this postponing it might be actually faster for you in getting to the council part where they're going to require more information from you to get it done. Yes, please come home. <coughs> this process is new for me, so help me walk through this process. We're here tonight. I meet on the 19th with the residents. Not asking for approval, just so it can move on through administrative process. The actual hearing of the homeowners and what's going on would happen at a later meeting, October 1st, correct? Well, you said you're gonna meet with them September 19th, I believe, right? right? But it's on the docket again for October 1st for the for final the, proof. For the city council? To if, right. So if it were to move forward tonight, it would be on the September 17th council meeting for a resolution of approval. And again, this is on the preliminary plat. And then of course, you've got to come back through the final plat process, which is essentially the same thing, different name, so. When's the next? Um, I guess that's fine. The, the next planning commission meeting is September 11th, and then after that, September 25th. Okay, when would we get on the, uh, if we did September 25th, would we get on the actual resolution, what is the type thing we get on the next? October 1st? Uh, October 4, 1st would be difficult. October 15th would definitely be possible. October 1st would not be possible. Let me look real quick. Yeah, we've got, so the, the way internally that our council items are set up, um, they have to be submitted a week before the meeting, so they go through different layers of approval from various departments within the city. Um, so you're six days out before that council meeting, which makes that really impossible. Okay. So the 15th is definitely workable, though. So what happens on the 15th if we have all our ducks in a row? It would be a resolution that would be placed on the council's agenda where they would either approve or deny the final plot, or not the final, excuse me, the preliminary plot. On the 15th? Yes. Okay. And then? Then you can start the final plat approval process, whatever else needs okay, to let's take say, place. Let's walk me through this. So final plat approval, what does that go to? That comes what back day? to the commission after oh, with the final day? plats. Uh, it, it really is dependent on you when you get all the platting documents together and an application submitted to us. It would be done in about 24 hours. You, so. so we're going through this again. Um, after October 15th, um, you know, you, and, and you can do the final plat in tandem too. There's nothing that says that you have to wait for the preliminary plat approval before you submit the final plat. Um, sometimes it's in your best interest because you can obviously put a lot of money into the final plat and then things change during the preliminary plat. Right. But if you feel comfortable enough to move forward, we can really accept that application really at any point. Okay. And then the final approval? Goes to the commission again. Which and then, the next date after October 15th is? Um, the next meeting after October 15th would be October 23rd, and then um, November 5th and November 19th for council. Since that's an ordinance and on a final plat, it has to go to two hearings, or two readings, excuse me. And that November 19th? Yes. I've missed, because I need to be going by the second week of November. Well, and, and let's, so, and, and you bring up, Thanksgiving. yeah, yeah, you bring that up, um, and again, the preliminary plat, you're, you're really looking at a conceptual plan here. So you're looking at, here's the concept of what we wanna plat. 
at that point, a final plat is pretty much just coming through and putting the rubber stamp on it, approving it, moving on. Um, this is this is a decision for you to make. You're an attorney to, or with your attorney to talk to as well. Um, you know, once the preliminary plat's approved, the the commission and the council are more or less giving their consent that we like this concept. Now come forward with the final plat, and we'll approve that. So I think. Not giving any advice, but you know, you could probably, after you knew that preliminary plat was approved, start doing the earthwork. There's nothing that says you have to wait till the final plat gets approved. It may be in your best interest. I don't know. The city um, does not have a policy against issuing land use variance permits contingent upon. Let me double check on that. If you, that's what we. Yeah, were yeah. Let we me. Uh, wanna, yeah, I don't want to speak on that because the there, there's grading permits and everything that you would need, and yeah. I need to talk with Public Works before I give you an answer. On what that. I do I'm on the golf course, sure I do on the golf course, and the land that I'm buying, I'm buying it from Land Trust. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, can you move? Off. Can you move? Can you meet with the residents next week? Uh, we need to give them time. I've already talked to a few. They're out of town. One's out of the country. Um, the 19th was <coughs> the many that I spoke to. We tried for the 18th, but we still had a lot of people conflicting. So the 19th is honestly the soonest. Not to mention, there's another issue that we're going to have a town hall meeting about solar panels that has been recently brought up. And I'm trying to do the research, uh, talk to an engineer, and find out the impact of that and let the homeowners put that up to a vote, whether they like it, don't like it, or going to prove it so I have two folds that I got to bring them together one I'm prepared for this the other one I'm not and I'm trying to do them both at the same time and, and not to really use this form as a as an avenue to discuss scheduling and everything but um, how about this you know, we can work together here in the next this week kind of come up with the timeline that see if it works for you based off everything we're hearing here um, depending on what the Commission wants to do tonight obviously but um, I'm more than willing to work with you guys and, and try to figure out some scheduling and see what we can do. So that's all I'm asking. Okay. Not so a problem at all. That's what I we're here for. We'll wait. Okay. So, Charlie, what date are we? If we if there's a motion made to postpone, what date are we supposed to postpone it to? The meeting you said was on the 19th with the neighbors. Yes. I w I mean I would recommend the 25th. That gives us 25th. some time to do that. And okay. All right, then, uh, then if there's someone here who would like to make a motion to postpone, they, they need to do so. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. In the matter of case number 18-310-02, Stone Canyon, second plan, I move that this matter be tabled postponed. as per discussion until such time. Postponed. Uh, postponed. Well, table postponed until September 25th. Our meeting is on September 25th, correct? It's a September 15th? 25th. 25th. Yes. So stated. Okay. Do I have a second? I second. Okay. Mr. Preston moved and Heather seconded. And unless there's any objection or discussion, we are ready for the vote. Commissioner Preston. Yes. Commissioner Reed. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. Yes. Commissioner McLean. Yes. Chairman Ashbaugh. Yes. Case number 18-310-02, Stone Canyon Second Plat has been postponed until our September 25th meeting. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but I do appreciate your willingness <coughs> to work with these folks. Thank you very much. And I hope it's not too much added stress on your, <laughs> on yourself. So. Uh, we're ready for our next, uh, our next item, as soon as I can find it. We're ready for case number 18-100-15, rezoning of 19301 East Salisbury Road. Will the city please give its report to us? Yes. Um, looking at the um, vicinity map here, you notice it's near the intersection of uh, Salisbury Road and Jones. We're talking a home about um, uh, a block uh, west of there on the south side. There, the T intersection with Sioux Avenue. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Stewart and uh, Nina Diaz um, request to rezone the property at 19301 East Salisbury Road from R6 single family residential to RA residential agriculture. So, and as you can see on the slide here, um, the, the vicinity is all RA, um, the large lot to the east, uh, the large properties to the south and the west, as well as the Farview Heights subdivision to the north. Um, there is RA in the area um, on the other side of Jones Road currently. Um, uh, the applicants uh, live at the residence at 19301 East Salisbury Road. It's a four-acre track where they have engaged in beekeeping and product uh, sales operation uh, without proper zoning. Staff has been made aware of the zoning violations due to citizen complaints um, being zoned R6. The property would need to be zoned, rezoned to RA to permit beekeeping. Uh, the applicants argue that the size of their property and the surrounding semi-rural nature uh, support their request. Uh, the main arguments uh, against the change to uh, rezoning pertain to the proximity of uh, Farview Heights addition and other residences and the comprehensive uh, plan um, envis uh, excuse me, envisions uh, residential neighborhoods for this area eventually um, so we'll go through the pictures here this is uh, an aerial so you can see the property is narrower toward the street so there's a, a residence that's uh, catty cornered up northwest of there and then the denser subdivision across um, to the north and then there's uh, semi-rural properties on either side into the south. And uh, here is um, the notification map of the areas around the property. Um, this is looking directly south of Salisbury at um, the zoning sign there along the property line. Um, this is looking um, Let's see, we're east up Salisbury, um, past Sioux Avenue there. And this is uh, looking to the west. Uh, the, these are, this is the house located at the corner of Sioux and, and Salisbury on the north side. And then this is looking northwest along the roadway. Uh, this is the next door neighbor to the west as well as the property of the applicant himself that themselves that wraps around that on the on the east and south side of that neighbor's property and then this is looking more directly at that property and you can see um, the distance back to the road and and the wooded area that's around it Um, staff concludes that the size of the property and the surrounding semi-rural nature supports the request, but also uh, concludes that downsizing, downsizing this property creates a hurdle for possible future residential development of this area. So staff takes no position on this case. And I'm ready to take any questions you may have. Does anyone have any questions for Brian? On the basis of reasonable standards code, what is the ruling for purposes of beekeeping in terms of proximity to housing? Albeit we're talking about a business that's not licensed, operating outside of codes. What are the standards for operating bees? Do we have a... Uh, ne nothing in the zoning code. Um, I know, I shouldn't say I know, I'm, I'm pretty sure the animal control was involved in this uh, enforcement action as well. And they may have uh, some 
uh, authority or regulations on it. I'm I'm not 100% prepared to answer that question because I don't know, but I, I know that we've talked with them on the issue, at least I have, and I do believe um, there was some recommendations on this as far as, you know, making sure there was a water source uh, for the bees near the beehives in the interim to make sure that they weren't uh, leaving the property to find water and stuff, stuff like that. I'm, I'm kind of speaking off the top of my head from what I can remember. Um, don't take that as a gospel. I'm not 100% sure that's accurate, but um, that's, that's my understanding. But we could, we could definitely check with them. Yeah, for instance, it had, assuming for the moment, at the time they decided to start this operation and there was proper zoning, mm -hmm. what would we have, that's what I'm looking to, what would we have looked to for purposes of determining this type of an operation in proximity to residential neighborhoods? The, the only thing we would have to look at is, is the, the type of structures that are used for the operation to see if they meet any of our accessory dwelling standards as far as setbacks and stuff like that, which pretty minimal. Um, but uh, that, that's really the only thing we'd be looking at. I think that okay. would be wonderful, <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> okay. Well, if everybody's agreed, let's just go ahead and hear from the applicant, and uh, um, I'll proceed that way. Um, make sure you state your name and uh, speak into the microphone. Give your Mr. Name Chair, and address. Yes. You didn't stand and take the oath. I'm an attorney. I don't have to take the oath. Oh, you're I'm an not attorney. testifying. All right. I'm arguing. I'm advocating. Thank you, Council. Okay. <laughs> At least uh, I'll, I'm Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Marine Corps, and I'm willing to take the oath. And I respect you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not a religious thing or a or a patriotic thing. I just it's been my practice in in zoning. Right. I just noted that you didn't take the, okay. and, and perhaps I should have allowed you time to identify yourself appropriately. Well, I I, I noticed we've got an attorney here, so we're in good stead. <laughs> Anyhow, my name is Michael Lavota. Uh, I am an attorney. My address is 400 Northeast uh, Brockton Drive, Lee Summit, Missouri. I've practiced uh, law for 45 years. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Kansas, uh, undergraduate law school. I'm a, a former uh, judge advocate in the Marine Corps, a federal prosecutor in organized crime and racketeering, and I'm Italian. <laughs> uh, I've done most of my practice for the last 30 years in eastern Jackson County, um, and it's, I started off working with, uh, s some of you may remember Sam Cottingham. Uh, he was the city attorney and was killed in the Hyatt Regency. Mm -hmm. um, and we did a lot of zoning uh, and a lot of real estate. Um, today, <clears throat> we are here. Mr. Lovoda. Yes. Just could you, may, you might have to pull the microphone down okay. just a little bit. Okay. Thank you, sir. T today we are here, and what we have done is that we have uh, noticed uh, those individuals that are located within 185 feet as required by that. And uh, I'd like to borrow your... The red button. And there is uh, Salisbury Road. I think he's getting you a better map. I was trying to. Um, and Mr. Lavoda, if it's possible to use the pointer and to speak into the microphone, oh, that would okay. be awesome. Okay. I can do that. I Thank will you. fix this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's that rural. I think you need to look for it. <laughs> okay. Well. Well, uh, we, I think we understand what you're saying. Is that but the south side of Salisbury. The, the south is side, um, uh, in, I was, uh, for 10 years I worked for the Jackson County County Counselor's Office and I was the delinquent land tax attorney and I did all the uh, appeals on uh, property taxes. Uh, all of the property located south 
is designated for agricultural use by Jackson County. Uh, those people don't pay. Uh, uh, they're classified uh, as agricultural, and then they only pay tax on residential for one acre of their lots. The use of this property uh, probably in the future is going to be exactly what it is right now because most of the lots there are big. Uh, my clients uh, purchased it because uh, they wanted to, an area that uh, was still in independence but, uh, but had an agricultural farming use. They plan on, on having horses there. A lot of the neighbors do have horses, and we have a witness here that we want you to t uh, hear from about the use of horses and bees mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and that. Um, we um, uh, believe that this area uh, is uh, agricultural, uh, at least Jackson County believes that the entire area south of Salisbury is, is, is for agricultural use. We believe we have an agricultural use even though the bees are the little workers uh, 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 that, uh, that do the agricultural. Uh, first off, um, in looking at this issue, and I, I want to talk to you, uh, Mr. Preston, um, the use of bees in urban areas is uh, a new phenomena uh, over the last 20 years. We've been losing our bees uh, and, and the hives, uh, I think from 1950 to now, we've lost half of, our, of, of the bees that, that were located in the United States. There's a new movement uh, to allow uh, uh, people in agricultural, in your urban areas to allow bees. Currently, the independence code just says you have to have four acres uh, and, and uh, you have to be zoned agricultural. Uh, we talked to the city about uh, using the designation by Jackson County of agricultural use uh, as being uh, an exception to the, uh, 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 like a variance of sorts, and they said uh, they didn't believe that the city council liked uh, uh, giving up their power to another uh, um, uh, institution, and so that's why we're here. We want to comply uh, with the ordinance. Uh, but to get back to the point I was trying to make is that uh, the cities of uh, Los Angeles, New York, London, Paris, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, St. Louis, have all now, uh, and, and, and Kansas City, allow bees to be used in an urban environment. Um, as a matter of fact, what they're finding is, is that uh, the bees in an urban environment there's a lot of theories about why we're losing our bees, but a lot of it has to do with, with the uh, articles that I'm, I'm going to uh, give to you uh, to take, make, take a look at if you, if you wish. But a lot of the articles believe that, that the urban areas don't have the pesticides and don't have, have the problems associated with pesticides. And it's almost like our birds used to be 20 years ago when we were losing all of our uh, eagles and all of those because of uh, DDT. They find that the uh, urban area is a great place to, to have bees. Uh, there's an article in here in the, and it was on a, it's a public, uh, uh, public television uh, uh, reprint of, of it, but it uh, takes place in Philadelphia and all the bees are on the top of a, of a real sophisticated French uh, hotel that's 18, floor, 18 floors high. Uh, and this one beekeeper has has a hundred locations of bees in Philadelphia on in all types of and they said it's the perfect place for bees because they have all of these uh, uh, and be, be all these empty lots that have all of these weeds and that the bees really in, like the the, the uh, uh, this uh, environment and that uh, the bees that uh, are in urban areas are producing anywhere from from 30 to 50 percent more than the bees in agricultural traditional uh, areas. Uh, they're even having such a problem with bees 
in California that uh, they're becoming what they call gypsy bees. Uh, when it's time for all of the uh, uh, almond trees, there's a, a period that in which they pollinate. And, and, and when they pollinate, uh, all of the, uh, uh, they don't have enough bees to pollinate. And so people bring truck in and put bees at the, at the base of all of these trees, uh, almond trees, for a month period, and people get paid to, to do that, and they move their bees that way. Uh, and that's some of the problems that we're having with, with our agriculture in the lab. Uh, it's really becoming uh, quite a um, opportunity to, um, uh, for uh, us to take a look at the environment that we're in and understand that um, the use of bees in urban areas is probably the new frontier. It's the new idea uh, of this. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, we're just simply saying this is uh, a, a location that is classified by Jackson County by the, as, for tax purposes as, as agricultural, but to comply with the ordinance that the City of Independence has, we have to have your assistance to zone it uh, residential. Um, there are problems with water sources and other other types of things that uh, that my clients are willing to they've had bees prior to moving there they actually have do not live there yet they've bought the property they've improved the property uh, and they're uh, haven't brought their horses in yet they haven't purchased them yet uh, and they want to make sure that they can use these bees but they have brought the bees in um, and I'd like to uh, introduce you first off to um, uh, a witness. And here's her resume. There's it's quite a you can sit on your stool. Sure. It's fine. Thank you. Uh, would you just please state your name for the people? Kathy Misko, uh, 321 Southwest, 58 Highway, Center View, Missouri. Okay, and you've got your, your, your uh, uh, resume there. Uh, would you tell them your experience and, and what you find in terms of, of bees in, in urban and also uh, residential areas? That is my talking point. Okay, all right. <laughs> Do you want me to yes. begin? I, my nickname is Chatty Kathy, so I have to write things down to keep on point. Um, I actually travel all over uh, the United States going to North American Beekeeping Federation conferences and regional, and I'm involved in also teaching, and I am going to brag on the bees. That's why I have come here. Uh, I presently live in Centerview, and for 30 30 years I've been known as the bee lady voluntarily harnessing unwanted swarms and providing educational outreach throughout the western side of the state. I manage an average of 20 colonies. I'm past president of the 70 year old Midwestern Beekeepers Association which has hu hugged 500 members and a 100 mile radius of Kansas City. I've been awarded the Missouri State Beekeepers of the Year Award, founder of Bee, uh, Bee Heartland Beekeeping Partnership to bring advanced national speakers and advanced workshops to the western side of the state. I have been fortunate to testify on multiple occasions down in Jeff City to our representatives, and I'm going to tell you it was a very pleasant experience because it was like they had my talking points. It was incredible. And they work very hard themselves to promote beekeeping and encourage the availability of pure Missouri honey. 
Both bills passed, one was called the Honey Bill, and the other one, which takes effect today, is called the Honey Bee Bill, and it was to allow Missouri State tax exemption for bees and beekeeping supplies to try and help take burden off of the beekeepers. And of course, they have to meet cr criteria also. I represent rural and urban beekeepers who assure valuable pollination to orchards, including inner city outreach orchards for the disadvantaged and homeless, community gardens, and important family and commercial farmers. The beekeepers assure healthy, law, raw, local honey for themselves and try to meet the endless need of the public seeking honey, especially at the request of their physician, ordered for the purpose of seasonal allergies as a cough suppressant, wound care, and for metabolic balance to a diabetic diet. I know this is quite true because my husband is a local honey prescribing physician who serves as president of Physician Organization for SSM Healthcare in Jefferson City, Missouri. Local honey, independence honey, is unique and valuable, having its own fragrance, flavor, and vibe. It's as descriptive as each neighborhood street or garden that one would roll, stroll through. Local honey is a commodity, one of a kind, easy to market, and demands pride. The best way to assure that honey is local and is a raw product is to know who harvested it and where. This honey is highly sought after in local stores and city markets which are known to positively impact economic development and tourism by keeping dollars circulating into communi communities and avoidance of losing monies to other community states and countries. Access to local honey guaranteed success by having synergistic waterfall effect to the neighboring businesses. This is well understood in Kansas City where the River Key Market can bring in 22,000 people per weekend. Local honey availability contributes to local pride and promotes the access of locally harvest honey. Following Dallas, Texas, maybe independence can also be crowned with success of zip code honey. Raw local artesian honey harvested and advertised according to nearly 40 different Dallas city zip codes because the doctors do say get local honey, as local as possible. Our state insect is the honeybees, and honeybees are the smallest agricultural of animals and responsible for every third bite of food that we eat. They're solely praised for 90% of pollination of some plants. Not only are fruits and vegetables, but honeybees pollinate the forage that livestock feast upon. So that milk, that yogurt, that hamburger you enjoy, thank a honeybee. Although I'm preaching to the choir, honeybees are a basic contributor to the majority of agriculture. I would say size does not matter. Bees are free range and they'll fly a four to five mile radius of their colony, voluntarily and indiscriminately benefiting whole communities, urban and rural. Even though not necessary, honeybee pollination to a soybean field will increase its yield 15%. Our pollinators are still in trouble and beekeepers are at great risk economically in serving as their stewards. There's never been a greater need than now. Bees and beekeepers cover support in all means possible. Well above economic threshold, national honeybee colony loss increased again last year, greater than 40%. Financially distressing beekeepers and communities. Pers personally, for two consecutive years now, my bees have been damaged severely by routine aerial spraying. I live in an agriculture area, and mid-June through August, the planes don't stop. Normally, the bees are busy working nonstop until one hears the crop sprayers. And then not a bee can be seen except for the dead ones in front of the hives and then the neglected babies on the inside of the hives. Urban hives have a fairly better 
uh, chance because there aren't as many prophylactically blanketed agriculture sprays used in the urban setting. So bees tend to do better. And I have been to the hive in, at Times Square, New York City, Manhattan, Hell's Kitchen uh, District at the Clinton Community Garden. One beehive, 400 pounds of honey because of all the pollination that the bees do and all those city trees. Ms. Kathy, yes. I just I don't mean to interrupt you, but I kind of really do mean to interrupt you. So, okay. Um, I, I appreciate it. We, we know you're, we know you're a, a bee advocate, and I think all of us here like bees. So I just wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind just being available to us as when we need to ask you a question for a resource. Because I would be happy to. Would yeah. you, would you like for me to share? I'm. A, I also have horses, and how I have experienced the bees on my property of 30 years. I think that if we have a question, that we will do that. And I'm. I'm not. I don't mean to be rude. I just want to make sure that we have everybody has a chance to, to speak. Okay. Does that make sense? To that you? does. No. And thank you. Ver thank you very much. I think. Um, if, if he would, we, we may ask you questions because you are an expert and we aren't. So if you wouldn't mind taking a seat, I'd appreciate it. Thank can you. Can I ask one, one favor that you would You can read, ask one favor. Read yes. what I wanted to tell you today. I, I, I really actually care. did. Thank actually. You're a fast reader. <laughs> I actually did while you were talking. I'm a fast reader, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, that would be fine. I, I would like to talk to them. I just, um, if we can kind of get to the point, because I, because we know something you don't know, like basically is what I'm saying. So, um, but I would like to hear from you folks, and I'd also like to hear from people who are in opposition. Okay. Yes. State your name. My please. name is Stuart Dietz. Uh, we're currently at 14500 East 37th Street South okay. in Independence. And uh, we bought this property over a year ago with, uh, you know, the hope that, uh, um, you know, to meet our needs for Nita's horses and our bees. And we'd been looking for some time for uh, property with at least three to four acres like this is, uh, kind of on the borderline of a city where you know we didn't anticipate that there would be any issues and in fact we were under the impression uh, from several sources that we wouldn't be in violation of any city ordinance by having the bees there and uh, well, and I then, understand that. I, can I ask you just real quick how many horses do you intend to, to bring to onto the property uh, maximum of two okay maybe just one all right and um, how many hives um, do you have on the property now? Approximately 20. Okay. And can you show me kind of where they're located, please? Okay. On the on, property, on, on the map yeah. behind you. Okay, and so you have, you said 20 hives? Yes. Okay. Do you have a source of water for them? Yes, we do. We have uh, three containers of water with floats that the bees are utilizing. Okay. And, uh, you know, we weren't aware that there was a problem until we got the complaint from the city. And, and, you're, and you're selling, uh, you, you plan on having like a home business and selling honey from this location or oh probably minimal just face to face a lot of what we sell you know we meet up with people in you know different locations where it's convenient for them if we happen to be in various parts of the, the metro okay 
All right. Is there anything else you'd like to like yeah. to add? And uh, I might also add that um, uh, I have had bees since 1973 is when I started due to the interest generated from the beekeeping merit badge in scouts. Um, had up to 350 hives in the in the past before I got busy with other pursuits. Um, the other thing that uh, I'd like to mention is that in, in the past when I lived in Topeka, Kansas, of, in fact in recent years, we've had bees in the backyard of a reg regular residential neighborhood and haven't had any issues there. We know several people that similar situations and also in the Kansas City metro. As far as we know from our research, Independence is the only city in the entire Kansas City metro that has any restriction as far as not allowing uh, bees in, in the urban areas. And I know, you know, several beekeepers in different cities that in the metro that, uh, you know, have had bees for anywhere from five to 30 or 40 years with no issues. And, you know, obviously we want to try to do everything we can to comply with the ordinance and, and uh, we want to definitely have a amicable relationship with the, the neighbors. Um, you know, if they'd have come to us first, we would have certainly been glad to, to uh, work with them. But like I say, we, and we, you know, we'll still do anything we possibly can to, to uh, you know, definitely make life easy for them. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, and another thing, you know, like Mr. Lavota alluded to is that, uh, you know, when we saw the property, you know, to the, directly to the property to the east of us, which is part of the R6 zoning, uh, you know, which there again, we weren't aware that that wasn't RA at the time, but there's horses and cattle there. And then the neighbor on the west of us has a horse. And so, you know, but virtually on all sides of us, like Mr. Lavota said, except for on the, the north where there's the uh, residential area, um, you know, it's pretty much as agricultural as, as you can get without being outside the city limits. Sure. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's uh, about all I can think of offhand other than, like I say, I could, you know, cite several examples of uh, beekeepers that have any number of hives in the in the KC Metro in in urban areas, even in, like I say, residential neighborhoods like mine in Topeka where, you know, the bees are vir virtually 30 feet away from the, the door of the neighbors. Mm -hmm. Never had any issues. Okay, well, we appreciate that and we may ask questions of you later when, sure. when the public hearing is, is over with. But okay. thank you very much for sharing. Okay, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Uh, name and address for the record, please. Nita Sue Dietz, 14500 East 37th Street South, Independence, Missouri. Okay. We just briefly share with us what the health benefits are, okay. if you would. Uh, when I met Stuart um, about 10 years ago, um, I had always suffered from uh, seasonal allergies um, my whole life severe in the fall, not quite as severe the rest of the year. Uh, always had to take prescription medication, had the itchy eyes, sore throat, runny nose, or stopped up nose. Uh, I also suffered, uh, since I was a teenager, from lower back pain, and well, back pain in general, as many people do. Um, so Stuart has suggested that I get some bee stings for my lower back pain. And uh, after a couple of months of talking about it, uh, I actually talked my uh, brother into getting stung on his foot because he's a runner and he had a sore foot. Uh, so he did it. And then my sister, this was all the same day, 
my sister had uh, some knee pain, and so we talked her into getting a sting on her knee. And uh, a few days later, they actually told me that it helped. And so I thought, well, I would try it for my back pain. And uh, it actually started to help. And so over that summer of uh, 2010, um, I would do, I worked my way up to about 40 stings a session. And uh, that fall was the first time in my life that I did not have to take prescription medicine to make it through the fall. At the time, I was teaching here in Independence, and I had students that were complaining of itchy eyes, runny nose, their stuffed up nose. And because at first I thought, well, maybe it's just not, not a bad year or a bad fall for allergies. But then everyone around me that suffered from allergies was telling me how bad it was. So I knew that the bee stings had helped not only my lower back pain, but my allergies. And like I said, that was in 2010. Over the years, I have continued to get some bee stings, some on purpose, some not. Um, but I do not suffer um, like I used to. Uh, I still do not have to take uh, prescription medication to make it through the fall. Um, so, and I also know other people that have gotten the bee stings. Um, I, I know a lady that has fibromyalgia, and she gets bees from us. Uh, and takes the bee stings. Um, I know it is helpful for uh, people with arthritis and many other diseases, actually. So um, I just wanted to share that, uh, that bees not only help us with our food through the nutrition, uh, but they can help. And, and there are studies and books written about the benefits of bee venom therapy. So, Well, thank you very much for sharing that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, maybe. <laughs> Briefly, yes. Uh, yeah, one thing that I forgot to mention is, is just the bees that we have on our property uh, represent an investment of uh, about $7,000. And, so, and with the amount of time and work that go into them, it, it, it's, it's pretty significant. And like I say, with one of the major reasons that we bought the property was, was for having the the bees and we haven't moved in because of other issues that we're trying to uh, address with the property that wasn't disclosed when we bought it. Thank you. Mr. Lovoda. I'm going to just say one thing and that's just is you go up this street here it's called Truman Road and you'll see a beautiful new farmers market. It's dedicated to the local farmers and 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 I, th I think that uh, uh, having uh, independence honey at our local markets would uh, be a, a definite benefit uh, because of the quality uh, that, it, that it has. That's all. Thank you. Is there anyone else present that would like to speak in favor of this case? Okay. Is there anyone else? Here who has questions or is opposed to this. Please come forward to the podium and state your name and address for the record, please. Sorry, sitting too long. My name is Robin Shockley. I live at 19225 East Salisbury Road. I am the, I don't have a pointer, but the biggest yeah. house that you see right there on the south side. The closest to the road? Yes, the one closest to the road. That is my property. Okay. Their property L-shaped around our property. Um, I have lived in that house for 25 years. I, They were talking about investment. Um, I totally understand the purpose of bees, the significance of bees. I understand that. Um, I have spent well over $20,000 in landscaping, decks, patios in my backyard to enjoy the rural area, that, the reason why I bought the property. Um, but I am not able to sit on our deck because within five minutes, 10 minutes, 
You have bees pinging you in the head. We also have bird baths, we have fountains, we have a pool, which are huge water sources. And obviously, uh, some of the bees don't know to go to the sources that they've been supplied to. And so I know this spring before we uncovered our pool, there had to have been millions of bees sitting on the cover of the pool in the standing water. You could not go around in our backyard without being, you know, you're out there constantly swatting your head to keep the bees away from you. I know that I also, I'm the one that complained. I also started, I came up to the city, got the petition. Uh, all of the neighbors did sign the petition except for two of the rental houses across the street from us because they're owned by people that I don't even know where they live. Um, they're not local. And then the largest property owner, which is if you look to the right of the circle where they have the cattle, the horses, all of that, um, she declined to sign. She was worried about legal repercussions and being a, at odds with the neighbors. Um, when, as soon as we noticed the influx of bees at our property, that's when I got online, started looking up to see, I mean, at first it was just a question, are they allowed to be in the city limits? My understanding from reading what I read on the code that they were not in residential areas. Um, I realize the area is rural, but I pay residential properties. I do not pay agricultural property taxes. Um, I don't know about the other homeowners. Um, I filed the complaint. The person from the city came out, took pictures. Uh, the barn where they were showing that the hives are located is, I would say, 50 feet maybe from my property line. So they are very close proximity to my house. Um, I do know the neighbors across the street that I've spoken to and the neighbor on the other side of me have also had issues with the bees on water sources. Um, I know the neighbor came over to my home after I filed the complaint, uh, stating that he understood someone had filed a complaint. I did tell him that I had been the one that did, had done it. Uh, I know he <coughs> couldn't understand why I didn't come to him and mention it, but no one came to us and mentioned that they were moving them in, nor that it was gonna be a business. You know, I understand uh, people having a beehive or something, but when you have 20 or probably more, depending on how big they're wanting to make this bee business, it makes a big difference on your outside activities. We have family members that are allergic to bee stings, and I don't want to kill bees, but I don't want to be stung or not be able to go out and enjoy my property. Um, I mean, mainly that's my complaint. I, I want to be able to enjoy my property. I don't deem anyone ill will about starting a small business, enjoying rural property, having horses, having cows. I don't have a problem like that. But a cow is not gonna come up and hit me in the head while I'm sitting on my deck. So that's an issue that well, I have. Well, don't say never, it, it could possibly. Wouldn't happen. say never, but I mean, yeah. You know, when pigs fly. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, I have gotten all the signatures of the neighbors um, except for three, and I know there's other neighbors here that are going to speak this evening, but that's just my version of what the problem is. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there someone else who would like to speak against this case? Make sure them, you're talking in the microphone. State your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Barbara Ummel, and I live at 19205 East Salisbury Road. Um, the majority of um, 
I believe uh, the applicant's property uh, adjoins my pasture where I do have a horse. I have 10 acres. Um, I too appreciate bees and understand their importance and I can pretty much see beekeepers on the 18th floor of, of a hotel that's gathering honey maybe for, for local use because there's nobody living on that roof or that 18th floor. But um, I too, I have a water tank of course for my horse and the bees do use it as a water source. Um, I don't use pesticide, I don't want to kill bees, but my horse will come and try to put his head in the tank and then the bees, you know, he jerks his head up. He has to have a water source available to him 24 seven too. Um, the summer with it being so very dry, many a time I have taken a bucket of water, carried it out off away for him to drink and sometimes that was effective, but I know you've probably all heard the expression, you can lead a horse to water. Uh, he wants to drink when he wants to drink, not necessarily when I'm there with the bucket or he knocks the bucket over. So that has been a difficulty for me too. Um, likewise, I am allergic to bee stings. I have EpiPen in my house in my, my master bathroom. Um, because it's an issue. I have uh, grandchildren who come to visit, young grandchildren, and that when they go out on the deck, they are very fearful when they see bees out there. So it, it has been an issue for me, but I, I understand bees are very important. I love honey. Um, I have read too about the advantages of local honey, um, but there are, there's a Right there at the T of Jones and Salisbury, there's several hundred acres back in there that actually I have permission to ride my horse on. And that might be a great place for beekeeping, but on a small a plot as four acres with houses in such close proximity, and in my case, you know, an animal, it, it doesn't seem appropriate to me. Um, so that's my issue with it. And I, I also I wish no ill will toward you know my new neighbors, but but it is a problem for me as well. Okay. So. Well, thank you for sharing. Is there anyone else here? I think you know what to do. Just make sure you state your name, the address for the record, please. Okay, I am Doug Lindeman, and I live at nineteen two one two East Salisbury Road. And that is on the north side of Salisbury Road, so I live in the residential area over there. Okay. It was probably March, I think, when they put the hives in. My neighbor came knocking on the door, my silver maple in the backyard, covered in bees, because it's oozing sap in the springtime. Covered in bees, the kids didn't want to come out on the porch, nothing, scared to death of it. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't even realize they had the hives in over there. I didn't, I didn't know for a few days. And I figured, well, when I found that out, I figured out why the bees were coming to the sap on the tree. So that was one issue we had. We have lots of flowers at our house. I've never seen one of their bees on our flowers. I don't know what's pollinating what over there, but I've never seen a bee on our flowers. I have a bird bath in the backyard, which is maybe 300 yards from their beehives. And I got a picture here of what our bird bath looks like. I mean, just covered in bees, if anybody wants to see it. Sure. And this is every day. I'm a, I'm a nature lover, I love birds. We can't even have a bird come to our property and there's so many bees. And again, I understand bees, but not in the area where they have them, not that close to people. And that's only one portion of the bird bath. Neighbors on the north side don't want it. And I, I don't mean to be mean or be rude to anybody over here, but it, it doesn't belong in a residential area. That's all I got. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak against this case? Please make sure you speak into the microphone, state your name and address for the record. 
My name is Marilyn Pontalian. My address is 19111 Salisbury Road. I'm the third house from this property. And my house sits back far off the road, so I'm on direct line for the bees when they come out of their hives. And um, one thing, I wasn't notified about this, and when I did the zoning on my property to divide it, we had to send lender, letters to everybody. I just happened to see the sign on the side of the road. Don't know whether that's still the, the, the procedure or not. That's like 135 foot from well, your property. Well, my house would get in that, I'm pretty sure. Well, Anyway, okay. I've got five acres. My daughter lives next door, has got five acres. So that's 10 acres. And not everybody pays agricultural taxes there. It's only if you had, when that house was built, there had to be a crop on it. Then you got zoned for partial agriculture. Otherwise, it's total residence. Um, one of my questions was gonna be how many horses and then how many acres do the bees require? And there's only four acres, which includes his long driveway from the street and then his house. So really you're only talking about putting the horses and the bees in probably two and a half to three acres. The house and the long driveway from the street has to come off of, you know, if they need four acres. Um, like the neighbors have said, there's no ponds. So they're going for every bit of water they can find. Bird baths, Barbara's horses, horse trough, and you, there's no way you're gonna keep them from them. And uh, several of the people across the street have, have uh, swimming pools. I'm sure a little chlorination is not gonna keep them away either. Um, I personally have, have a, a, do not have a green thumb. I have no pollen for them to collect. Um, but the, the two neighbors next door do have a lot of flowers, and so they are gonna get swarmed if that's what these bees are going for. Um, let's see. And if you do approve this, and they do start a business, I would, I would want them to be required to get a business license and keep it current every year. Because I know they can take it on garage, they can take it different places, but it's still gonna increase the traffic in that area. And God knows they, it's a racetrack. Salisbury is a racetrack. I've even gotten hit trying to get out of my driveway because they top that hill at 60 miles an hour, even though it's only 30 miles an hour. So. That's my comments. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak against this case or who has questions? Okay, I don't see anybody trying to get the podium, so we'll clear. We, we want to hear from staff. As well, yeah, but I can close the public hearing portion, can't I? Well, could I respond to a couple of Yeah, I mean, we'll. We're going to close the public hearing portion, but that doesn't mean that we can't call you up. You know, okay, so just hold on. <clears throat> I would just like I would just like to say just and is, is that I don't think that we as a city have enough information unless our esteemed colleague over there has discovered anything in the code to give us any more information about bees. The code is not very helpful. Right. Well, that's often the case. Okay. <laughs> what I what I would like to suggest that someone moves or I can move it, but I think in my experience, the chairman usually doesn't move things, is that we refer this back to the city to do a study on if we're going to allow beekeeping, what should the 
ordinance say? What should the code say? What should the rules be? Because I can see both sides and this is a growing hobby and I think that we need to probably bring our code up to speed and do do some of that. So uh, if someone else could could actually refer that back to city staff and probably give them at least a month or so, not at our next meeting, but the, maybe the meeting after that, to bring us back their findings. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. While I'm prepared to do a motion, I would like to give a comment. Yes, you may. Go ahead. Uh, it's wonderful to have hobbies. And sometimes hobbies can be profitable and certainly enjoyable. But I think it's the expectation of any resident that they may be able to live in their house in peace without any expectations that uh, one or two loving bees may sting and sting and sting again. Well, bees don't sting but once. Those are comments. Well, and, and I think it is, <laughs> it behooves us to and therefore, I will make a motion in light of those comments that this matter be tabled for this moment, postponed to such time that we can have staff promulgate, form such regulations and codes that would be appropriate, mindful of the fact that this, this applicant is sought to operate a business. It made some errors in the process and that there are residents with great concern that should be considered. So I so move. Sorry. Oh, so no, no, no. I, I table, wait, I hold. Maybe if we talk for a little moment and get to a more concise motion. But I, I think part of my hesitancy too is to, if we do the agricultural thing, we are limiting the residential future, right? So I think part of our motion should be, like you're saying, is I think we need to look at other cities and see what practices are. Because right. It's a cool thing. Yeah. And I think it'd be great to welcome that to independence in a safe way and have our own, on our own independent county. That's super cool. That's and there is a diseconomy in scale. Sometimes that beehive a single hive or two in a neighborhood of course it's beneficial but there is a diseconomy of scale also so, so we don't have you. we're gonna so move that we yeah Go ahead. i think what we're saying is we want the code to reflect like a hobbyist how many hives there should be i think you have to have at least two hives in a nucleus or something like that Real quick. And then what that would be, yeah. residential, and then what it would be if it was on agriculture. For, for more sake, specifics. Yeah, for the sake of parliamentary procedure, real quick, we do have a motion on the table without a second. So, well, I have, unless you're withdrawing. No, I, I simply paused. I hit pause. Yeah. Oh my. And what we actually need to do is we actually we have a need to re we ref discussion. Yeah. refer it to them. We need to actually refer it back to them as a, as a language we need to use. Yes, and direct true. them how we want, what information we want back. Therefore, in the language of our esteemed chair, <laughs> I move that we refer this matter of the case number 18-100-15, rezoning at 119-301 East Salisbury Road, be referred back to staff for further consideration. Thank you. Maybe, but not yet. <laughs> Do I have a second? I second. Okay. Let's take a vote on this first. Commissioner Preston. No. Commissioner Reed. No, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> what? <laughs> I stand, I'm voting no. Uh, Okay. Yes, to the to the motion. That's okay, Bill. We suspended the rules. We never put them back <laughs> we in. So we them back. Okay. Where when I need? Where were you, Counselor, when I needed you? <laughs> so, so he's a yes, right? Okay, that's a yes. Let's proceed. 
Commissioner Reed. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. Yes. Commissioner McLean. Yes. Chairman Ashball. Yes. Now, can we ask our yes. questions? I would like to see us in our code deal with a hobbyist and also deal with someone who may be in business and see what is recommended by other cities and adopt something because this is probably going to come up over and over again. So I, I don't think anyone of us here is, is against <coughs> bees. I think it's, it's great, but you know, how much is too many uh, in a residential area? So we need to put your brain trust together and give us some excellent guidance. And we're yeah. counting on you guys. It's super fast. And, and, also and you have an expert here that you could probably talk to. But, you know, we, and I don't mean this, we do need to keep in mind that there's got to be some kind of middle ground for the residents and for the person that wants to do some of this. So it's a big challenge, Charlie, but I, I'm sure you're up to it. <laughs> Nothing's too big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll look at it, and, and I don't know, the, the one thing I didn't hear from the commission was a, a deadline or, or a time that you wanted to come back, um, and if there's any ideas on that, but we can, uh, we'll start looking, uh, kind of comparing what typical, typical process for us is we'll look at surrounding communities uh, within Jackson County especially, at least some at Blue Springs, Kansas City, see what they do. Um, can you I'll, get back I'll, to us by the second, maybe at least our second meeting, no longer than that? Yeah, that shouldn't be. Which issue. would be the last meeting in September? Yeah. Um, yeah, from my standpoint, I, I, I don't disagree that our code is probably a little bit of out, outdate, outdated on, on this issue. Um, I, I, it, it comes up, and there's other issues as well, too, other agricultural issues, chickens in backyards and stuff like that that is starting to become more prominent. So um, we'll, we'll focus on the bees for now, but if other things come out of it in the end, um, so be it. Okay. All right. Is that the twenty fifth? I believe it is. Yeah, let me double check on that real quick. I don't have my calendar. Yes, yeah, September twenty fifth and we'll work with you and, and let you know for sure. So. The, the, the animal field has given us an extension until October first. Okay. And I'll I'll double check with um, you're gonna work with those folks yeah. as well. Yeah, and we'll have to bring them on the table. The folks who filed the complaints and have that concerns. Here's your man to talk to, okay? <laughs> just, I mean, you can state your concerns as well. Um, I just don't want you to think that we're, you know, just giving carte blanche to anybody. That every citizen should give input, so please feel free to call them or email them or however they want to to interface with you. I think a, I think a, a bullet point list from any of the residences of the things that you, all the things that you listed, you know, the bees coming to the pool, the bees swarming. I, I just think a negative, like that checklist, at least from my perspective, would be helpful because then you can look at it and it helps identify ways. We gotta attack the negatives first in order to make the positive happen. That's always my way of doing things. Sure. If I can solve the problem, then I'm so that may mean that whatever the results are, that you folks may be allowed to keep some bees, but maybe not as many as you have. You might have to do other things, you know, on your property. I don't know yet. We need to see what happens with this. But I think that's a fair course to do, and we've, we've referred the case, and that's where it stands right now. I'll allow it if they're brief. Uh, not trying to split hairs, but if you would uh, look at the map, I believe Mrs. Shockley said our hives were no more than 50 feet away from their property. The building that they're next to is 30 feet wide, and so, um, you know, that's, that's not really accurate. Uh, the second thing is that um, once you get much beyond, you know, a few feet from hives, um, you know, maybe maybe 20 to 30 feet. It makes no sense at all for the bees to, to sting. It's not in their behavior because, as, as was mentioned, when they uh, sting, 
they lose their sting and they lose their life. So they're not stinging to defend themselves. They're stinging to defend their colony when they feel threatened. And, you know, for years and years we, we get uh, calls to, to come and collect swarms of bees that light on people's trees in their yards. Uh, some people aren't frightened of them. Some people go into a panic because they think they're going to be attacked, not knowing that bees in a swarming situation are full of honey and they're very docile and they're ready to move on. Not to say that, uh, you know, if you pinch one away from its hive or you step on one, something like that, yeah, there's a good chance you're going to get stung. But the bees have no instinctive incentive to sting, you know, 50 or 100 feet away from their, their hives. Well, thanks for sharing that. I, I do know that. I'm a landscaper and I'm around them all the time. So um, some people are definitely afraid of them and, and some aren't. But I think for now that's, I mean, I know for now that's what we're going to do. So we're going to talk about it. Um, uh, if, you, if you want, I don't know if they'll reach out to you folks or not, but if you want, you can always call the city and find out if this case has been put back on the agenda. And you're welcome to come and share your opinion. Okay, moving along, we're going to go to case number 18. Dash 175-03, dash the UDO amendment number 34, animal shelter and boarding. The staff give the report, please. Just for a matter of procedure on this, can I back you out to case number three and ask that we get a motion to postpone that to September 25th? Now you're talking, man. <laughs> uh, modify Thank you. to include September 25th. I'm, I'm talking about the uh, case 18... 810-02, the, the cargo largo um, oh. issue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, we had that on the agenda originally, yeah. and we're asking that that be uh, continued to September 25th, so we need a motion on that. Sure. Do you want to have a vote on that, or, or, or you want to just? I, I need a motion in a second and then a vote. All right. So, so moved. Uh, motion to approve. I mean, motion to postpone. Is that the word you want? Continue. Continue. Let's do that. Case number 18-810-02-PUD Preliminary Development Plan for 3232 South Nolan Road to September 25th. Should be used to that date. Then. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a voice vote. That's fine. Okay. Let's just say. Uh, a. Uh, all, all in favor say aye. 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 Aye as well. So there's none opposed, so it, it's continued. All right. All right. Um, let's go to the next, next case one. that you had already introduced. Uh, I will go as fast as I can on this because there's not really too much to it. And I'll uh, first give a quick background on this. Um, as most issues happen with UDO amendments, this did come from an issue um, that was brought to our light. Currently, the city um, does not allow any animal or boarding daycare facility. Uh, within 200 feet of residential to be allowed in any C2 or C3 zoning district. Um, I'll just give you, this isn't the situation that arose, but I'll give you an example. We have a lot of that strip zoning along 24 Highway where it's 150 feet off the center line of the road with residential behind it. Um, if somebody wanted to start a animal boarding facility, doggy daycare, anything like that, um, in a lot of situations would not be able to do it just because our zoning ordinance outright says you cannot do it. Um, what we are proposing tonight is to, instead of have that outright uh, prohibition on doing this, that we turn that into a special use permit process that is reviewed obviously by the commission. The commission makes a recommendation to city council. City council has ultimate um, approval and our denial or not and or end denial authority on this um, uh, I think for us we feel that you know this this gives us a chance to look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis um, instead of just uh, painting everything with a with a broad paintbrush and saying yes no instantly uh, it gives the Commission the ability to look at things and make sure that there's certain safeguards in place um, you know, look at elevation changes, for example, that can keep noise out of areas. Um, if we run into a situation where we don't think it's appropriate to have one of these facilities within 
uh, 200 feet of residential, uh, obviously the recommendation can be denial. And if we think that it is appropriate, then we can recommend approval. So uh, ultimately what this is doing is it's just taking away our authority to have to say no right away and, and giving that back to the commission and the council to review them on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so when you come back, you're going to give us more specifics about like if it's a doggy daycare, they can only have no more than 10 yes. per acre or whatever. Yes, yes, all that stuff would be included. We're not, we're not putting any extra conditions within our ordinance because uh, from our standpoint, I think we feel that a lot of that is covered uh, through the state pretty well, plus through our animal control ordinance. So um, yes, we'll, we'll bring all that info. Now, any, any cases that come forward on these, we'd bring those forward um, with all that information. And going back to the bees for a second, you look at the state stuff as well yeah, when well, you're trying to consider that. Yeah. that yeah, right? we'll, I mean, you, you have to pretty yeah. much, right? Yeah, we'll, all that information will get to you guys. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so you want a motion about this, right? Well, I'll make a motion that case number 18-175-03, the Unified Development Ordinance Amendment number 34, Animal Shelter or Boarding, be approved. Second. So are we really approving this or we're approving it based on what you bring you're, back You're to recommending us? approval to city council, then this will go forward to city council for the, the change. Without even seeing what the change is. We, he just told you the change, mm -hmm. the change will be. The change is, the change the is. The change is you're going to change it, but the, you don't know the specifics yet. Is that what you're saying? No, we do. Yeah. It just opens it up more. Yeah, and so, so right, again, right now we say if you're within 200 feet of residential, you cannot have it. What we're doing is we're changing that and saying you, may you be can have, have it, it if you get a special use permit from city council. Okay, and that special use permit. <laughs> yeah, special I use know, permit. But it's still the conditions. It's still no, the same thing. It's it's the same process that we do right now. We have we have criteria built within the special use permit process that they will have to meet. We can recommend conditions, all that stuff. That yeah, that that'll all be done on a case by case basis in the same manner that we deal with today. Okay, so there's no so it's just essentially yeah. Uh, all right. I just want to be sure because yeah. you, you got to have mean, some kind of you got to have some kind of standard somewhere. Yeah, written we do. Down. We and they're you built do. in there. Okay. It, here, give me a second. I'll standard. I'll go through them real quick just so. Well, it's not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> it's because he wears a nice tie. Give me one second here. <laughs> hey man, I got your back. <laughs> what section is right the top of your head? Here we go. So real quick, I'll just go through a few of these, but you have to look at the compatibility of the proposed use with the character of the neighborhood, the impact of the proposed use on public facilities. Um, I'm jumping around here. Uh, the extent to which there is a need for the use in the community, conformance of the proposed use to the comprehensive plan, things like that. So these are all criteria that are already built into our ordinance. Okay, Charlie, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. You have, you have my assurance. Okay, you're on tape. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to delay the proceedings. Go ahead. So we got we got a motion and a second. I'll take, okay. Uh, Commissioner Preston. Yes. Commissioner McLean. Yes. Commissioner Reed. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. Yes. Chairman Ashbaugh. Yes. Thank you. Case number 18-175-03-UDO, amendment number 34, animal shelter and boarding has been approved. Next is uh, approval of minutes, which I'm sure you've all read for thoroughly. Make a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, okay. I second. All right. Uh, all, all those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All right. Wait for it, people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> any opposed? Okay. The minutes have been approved. Is there any uh, things for? The city that we need to discuss, or the only thing or I you have anything for us? Is since we did not continue anything to your next meeting, we will not have a meeting on September 11th. There's no items available, so unless you want to be here, and I hope you don't, <laughs> but we'll be back on September 20. What's that? I won't be here on the 27th. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have. Looks like quite a few things on September 25th, yeah. so be prepared for that day. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, unless I hear an objection, we are adjourned at 8.09 p.m.